We all have a yearning for love, but relationships can be confusing and complicated. Dr. Tammy Balashevsky says it all starts from within. It starts with a journey to center. Here's your host for Journey to Center on Empower Radio, Dr. Tammy Balashevsky. Hello, my wonderful, wonderful friends. Yes, life can be confusing, rough, and bumpy at times, but we don't have to live our lives as if we're lost at sea being buffeted around. We can take action and partner with the same energy that moves the planets around the sun. We do have the power to align, surrender, relax, ground, and center ourselves. So if you are tired of working so hard at life and are open to experiencing a path of peace, grace, ease, and flow, this show and my guest today, Jillian Kaufman, is here for you. Jillian's going to talk about a simple framework based on scientific principles to help you get more done with less effort and less waste. We're going to receive wisdom and information from his new book, Let Go, Let It Flow, A Path to Peace and Personal Power. Jillian Kaufman is an electrical energy expert, and he's here to share his groundbreaking discovery on how to tap into and harness your personal power. After experiencing his own spiritual transformation and discovering the parallels between science and spiritual teachings, Jillian came up with four floodgates that regulate the amount of flow one experiences in their lives. Jillian says we all have the potential and capacity to optimize the most precious resource we have, which is our life force and our life. So Jillian, thank you so much for being on Journey to Center with me. Well, thank you, Tammy. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are an energy expert, and you were um, an electrical engineer. Is that right? It is. I studied electrical engineering uh, decades ago and practiced uh, as a professional engineer, worked for electric utilities, literally designing uh, power to the people. So transmission and distribution of electrical energy is something that I've been involved with from academics and in my uh, early professional life as well. So one would think that that would be a very different kind of thing than, than what your book is about, but you say they actually converge. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how this occurred and, and how this book came into being. What was this process like for you? Sure. Um, I guess, you know, like your show, it's a journey to the center and sort of discovering what life is all about. And I think for me, I was kind of looking for external validation, but then I had my own dark night of the soul where I woke up and realized there was much more to life than what I was currently perceiving and kind of uh, reconnected with my spiritual center through that and then literally had my light bulb go off when I recognized that some of the spiritual teachings were similar to what I had learned in my undergraduate electrical engineering days about resistance and energy flow and kind of the concept of spiritual energy uh, being akin to electrical energy. Um, my belief that everything in life is comprised of energy and science continues to make advancement and that we view electromagnetism as one of the four fundamental forces, just like gravity. So whatever we experience, our bodies are electrical. So, so much in life is electrical, our thoughts, impulses in our bodies. So it all just clicked for me and then sort of went down the path of, of writing and, and further investigating the flow gates that, that I discovered along the way. So, yes, you, you talk about your dark night of the soul and it does seem unfortunate. <laughs> and, and this was true for me, Jillian, that, uh, Pain was what um, inspired me to wake up. Mm -hmm. It was what brought me to my knees. So I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about your story and how you would describe awakening. Sure. Um, I'll, maybe in reverse. I mean, to me, the awakening part came when I realized I wasn't my thoughts and I wasn't the circumstances that were going on around me. But it took a long time to kind of get to that point. And I think over years... Things had kind of built up, superficial things that separated me from the core truth of who I am. So I um, I grew up during the time of Ronald Reagan and conspicuous consumption, yuppie, 
materialism of competitive type A guy and was driven and just realized that in a pursuit of material things, um, it's like empty calories, you know, you're still hungry all the time. Mm -hmm. And I got married, had children, and then um, really experienced profound love of, of my children, which is very natural. And um, my older daughter uh, nearly died. And through that process, I realized just how precious life was and started seeing things a little differently and wanted to really change the way I was living. But then the my, my journey and my evolution wasn't quite complete. And then it was sort of the last uh, vestiges of my sort of superficial identity, being a, a married man and working for certain companies, all those things were taken away. So I was really kind of left without the superficial identity for a while. And that was hard to uh, come to terms with, but it was through that, that process of kind of stripping all that away that I awoke and, and realized that I was not my thoughts. And it was kind of from that point, the awakening began and really felt a surge of energy um, through me in life. It was like I was born again, that uh, life was wonderful and all the little simple things that I had maybe taken for granted became uh, very clear and enjoyable to me. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm really relating to what you're saying, because I, I think there are two ways to live our lives from the outside in or from the inside out. And what you're speaking of, it, 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 it resonates. The superficial identity is derived from external validation or, I think, trying to live from the outside in, trying to accumulate, acquire. And I love how you talked about empty calories. That's really what it feels like. It's not what mm -hmm. really feeds our soul that comes from that internal reference that, that connection, uh, I think, to uh, that something greater and the happy for no reason can come from that. Exactly. I mean, when when my daughters were born, you, know, you watch the joy of a newborn and I kind of was wondering, like, well, where did that go for me? Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know, quickly got back to the busyness of life and the day to day uh, striving and aspiring and so forth. But, you know, that that. Um, observation of, well, wait, that's in there somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. But luckily, I was able to come back and, and reconnect with that. Uh, so part of what I want to do is share that with people so they don't have yes. to go through what I went through and um, that they can uh, do more with their life and not have to go through the dark night of the soul. So that's my, my aim. Yeah, I love that. I think that's, and I refer to you and myself as, as the wounded healer. Like we've gone through it. And so now our intention is to hopefully um, pay it forward to, to help share the wisdom and the light to anyone who wants it. So I, I love your, um, your intentions here and what you're doing. And your book really is a, it, it takes these, um, I think, complex principles and makes them very comprehensive. So I really, really enjoyed it. It was, it was awesome. Well, thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, I mean, pain does have a way of making us present. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, sometimes we may not want to face it or uh, try to avoid it. But I think that's part just being present with whatever you're experiencing is the beginning of experiencing life more fully because the present moment, that's really all we have. You read about that, but it's true. And it, it took me a while to kind of come to that realization um, so, you know, I, I applaud you and the efforts that you're doing with your show and your your outreach. Yeah, it, it uh, it's not empty calories. <laughs> it definitely is a, a more fulfilling experience when we get to be of service in some capacity. So um, thank you. And, and thank you for, you know, really stepping up in, in your life and sharing um, your truth and your wisdom. Um, I love something you said. This is such a great way of expressing it. You said during your dark night of the soul, you lessened your, you strengthened your relationship with God and you lessened yourself and connected more fully to your creator. You lessened yourself and you strengthened your relationship with God. I thought that was really beautiful. To me, that sounds like you're dialing down ego and dialing up I go. <laughs> 
That that's absolutely right. Yeah, the um the the energy what sort of came to that realization um with the way electrical energy flows, there's sort of real and apparent power, they call it imaginary power. And I think so much of what we experience, you know, we're physical beings, we're spiritual beings, and this dynamic between the two of what we experience um, was certainly present in my life. And I think that I, my ego was ruling much of what I was doing and I had to learn to let go and Kind of as you described in the in the introduction of living life from the inside out as opposed to the way I had been living, I'm looking for validation from the outside in. So, you know, connecting with that that true source and you know walking uh, at night or just being able to appreciate beauty of nature where, wherever you may be, that you can get a sense of something beyond yourself. And kind of tying it back to what you described about being a, a, a wounded healer, you know, serving others to me is the, the greatest gift that we can, can give each other and ourselves. So that's kind of the higher calling uh, to share our gifts. So ultimately helping others is really what we're here to do, be it our, our entertainment gifts, our knowledge, our companionship, encouragement, whatever. But that's kind of the, the turbocharging of the path, the flow gates that I talk about when you similar to a Maslow and the hierarchy of needs that start altruism and serving others. It really, uh, you lose a sense of yourself. And, um, I took a couple of psychology classes, um, in college, but, you know, I studied, um, the concept of flow and the, I, I really enjoy that sense where you're not thinking you're fully absorbed in the moment with whatever it is you're doing in that optimal state of being. And so to me, if we could live in that state of flow more, you know, there's less brain activity going on. You're fully immersed in whatever it is you're doing. You're able to create, and it's just a, a wonderful sensation. So um, that that's really ultimately what I think we can spend more time in that flow state. I love this. And you, you write about in your book something that's, that made things make sense to me is the different brainwave states, the, the beta, alpha, theta, delta. And um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that, but yeah, flow and being in the, the other brainwave states, the deeper brainwave states. Wow, it's so magical. So yeah, how do you, how do you um, discuss or describe these brainwave states? So sure, um, Mahaley Csikszentmihalyi is the founder of the concept of flow and then other uh, Stephen Kotler, Jamie Weil, they write about it in, in their books. But again, that optimal state of being, um, you know, whether you surf or little moments in your life where you just flow and you're totally present. So what they've been able to measure is that uh, people, when they're in the zone, they're not really thinking in the anxious beta brainwave state that we typically operate. So they're more in the theta alpha, very relaxed, and it allows um, unused or dormant facets of our brains to create new associations and, you know, um, creating and loving, those are attributes of God to me. And so as we can express those things, um, that's the, the best state for us to be. So um, from the measurement of the brainwave activity to the lower, calmer brainwave states allow for these creative flow states to exist. Mm -hmm. One thing that's kind of interesting is that, you know, from a energy and a frequency standpoint that higher frequency things require more energy. So there's some parallel or back and forth between the amount of energy in your brain versus the energy in your heart or your body. So moving out of your head and into your heart, there's only so much energy conceivably to go around. So how do you allocate that? If you can kind of get out of your head and get into your heart, you have more really do the real work. Um, 
So that's that's really what my teaching is all about. What I'm continuing to to learn and explore uh, mm-hmm. through my work. And it feels so much better. You know, it's like uh, the stress is much reduced. I know when I was struggling a lot with anxiety, I would I would meditate. I would I would say, God, what would you have me do? And I would hear the word relax. <laughs> but what do I do? Mm-hmm. Relax. But what do I do? <laughs> relax. <laughs> it was so yeah. funny, Jillian. So um, one thing led to another and I ended up uh, spending time with horses. And boy, that really helped me just get into that that alpha state rather than the beta state. And I just, I feel sometimes so just peaceful and aligned and kind of blissed out a little. My husband will look at me and go, who are you? But it really is about being in that more um, aligned, peaceful state. And I personally find, I and, and I wonder if this is your experience too, Jillian, when I live more from that rela- relaxed, aligned state, I see so much more um, synchronicity and grace and just incredible coincidence and God winks. And I'm like, oh, this is so much better than thinking and trying to make things happen on my own. Absolutely. I mean, there's a resonant throughout life and Mm. you kind of can pick that up from other people, the energy vibes that they get off the vibrations and like attracts like and you know, somebody walks into a room and you, it can change the feeling of the room and, and the mm-hmm. people that you're around with. And so much, um, you know, we're very energetic. Everything, uh, what I said earlier, that you know, energy comprises everything. We're learning more and more about it. You know, uh, I think we have an innate ability to pick it up. Mm-hmm. And that was one thing that I'm, I'm learning more and more, just um, controlling the environment and what I'm exposed to, be it music, people, food all those things that can negatively impact your body and ultimately how you are showing up each moment. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I remember reading that years ago about like when a mother Teresa or Dalai Lama would step in a room, they wouldn't even have to say anything. It was just their um, beingness that would transform the energy and the people in the room. Um, And Mm -hmm. you have a great quote, um, in your book where you say, when you feel empowered and energized, you step into the flow of abundant source energy yourself and you inadvertently invite others to do the same. Right, exactly. And, you know, with with a quote of uh, two ways to spread the light, you can be the light or the mirror that reflects it. And so much of what what happens with us, we're social social beings. And and you mentioned horses. And I think, People use horses for therapy because they're mm-hmm. so uh, sensitive to energy and can provide feedback mm-hmm. um, based on how people approach them. So if you're open and calm, then they'll approach you. But if you're tensive or aggressive or anxious, they'll pick that up and that makes them jittery too. So it's a, a nice mirroring of your emotions uh, reflected in these uh, animals. Um, so on a simple level, you can see how that is. And with humans, obviously, it's a little more complex, but the same basic transmission principles apply. Mm, It's true. Uh, Horses are wonderful mirrors and and our lives. I think if we pay attention, really is a mirror. The out there reflects the in here. So if we want the out there to change, we need to really change um, our relationship with ourselves and our personal relationship with with life. And um, something you talk about here. I think it's so important to discuss this, um, the power of emotions, because I think there's a lot of energy in that. You say authentic acceptance can only occur after we process our emotions, such as anger and sadness. We also must allow ourselves to cry our tears. Can you talk a little bit more about emotions from your perspective? Sure. As as a man kind of growing up in my family or, and whatever that was taught, you know, men don't cry and be tough. And I fought that for the longest time. But the interesting thing is that by putting up that resistance to those emotions, I was giving them power, taking away energy from other aspects of my life. And then it I was trying to stuff that down. And so then I was suppressing things. So I really wasn't present. My energy was diverted elsewhere. And it took me a while to, um, to allow that to, to experience whatever it is in that moment, 
um, joy, sadness, and the other other part of it is by opening yourself to feel what you feel that the joys are higher. Um, I think I had kind of attenuated feelings by stuffing down or repressing mm-hmm. sadness or when my when my daughters were going through their health scares and other things were happening to me that tried to be the stoic. And, you know, we're emotional creatures and it's difficult, if not impossible, you know, to, uh, to go through things like that. I am um, back to the, the animals. Um, I have a dog and I've noticed you know, when they get upset, they have an ability. They just kind of shake their fur back and forth, and it's like they're resetting themselves. And you know, if we have that ability through meditation or reconnecting with our source, um, that's part of my my practice, just to remind myself that it's okay and to notice whatever it is that I'm experiencing and to name and tame whatever emotion that, that may be coming about, but it was something that, um, I, it, I struggled with, and I think it was just a, a, a product of being a man brought up in my time and, and so forth. But I learned firsthand and as part of accepting whatever it is and allowing those emotions, allowing yourself to experience discomfort, to experience loss, the pain, allows you to experience the joy and the other Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful uh, sides of life. I think you're so right. And and so as you're speaking, what I'm kind of getting visually is like, if we don't allow our emotions, it sort of impedes the flow. It's like, I I know years ago, I, um, uh, my teachers said that they, they uh, sensed that I had a lot of unprocessed grief. And I think that really dialed down my life force. And, and I did really have to uh, look at that and cry my tears. And it did seem to open something up inside of me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, our, our bodies um, on a physical level are able to heal themselves. They want to heal themselves. And mm-hmm. so there are all these beneficial chemicals that can be released when you cry. And so your body is trying to heal yourself, but I think the fear of the momentary discomfort, and then it may even be the the fear of the fear that we try to avoid things and further cut ourselves off, where if we just um, kind of experience the first arrow of whatever that hurt is, we don't have to keep feeding in to the pain and suffering or by trying to avoid that. And then yes. being open and vulnerable, open-hearted to to life. I mean, it mm-hmm. it is painful, but it's beautiful at the same time. So, you know, it's a it's a wild ride that we're fortunate to experience here. So true, you know. And I do if we if I do believe if we try to keep the lid on the pot, and we try to control things, and we try to keep things suppressed, we are the ones that are going to suffer. We have to be able to open, like you said, Jillian, to one end of the spectrum to experience the other end. We have to be able to feel the the sorrow, the anger, to open up more fully to the grace and the joy and the bliss. So I, I think again, your book is amazing. Your teachings are so um, again comprehensive. Um, so Jillian, how can people get a copy of your book or connect with you if they want more information and wisdom? Well, thank you. Um, my website is, uh, juliankaufman.com. I'm on social media. Look forward to, uh, engaging with, with your listeners. Um, I have some free eBooks. I'm very interested in learning more. Um, this is a, a theory and, uh, things that work for me that, I want to share more and more and delve more deeply into each of the flow gates. So really would um, welcome additional dialogue uh, with, with your listeners around this. That's so awesome. And I'm super excited. You've agreed to do another show with me next week. So for any of you that are resonating with his uh, way of expressing truth, I'm, I'm looking forward to connecting with you during our next show next week. 
week. So Jillian, I think you're just full of wisdom and wonderfulness and you're so cute. I mean, usually electrical engineers are very left brain, but you're very head, heart, left brain, right brain. I just think you have a a very sweet soul and I'm just really honored to be having this conversation with you and to get you back on next week. Thank you, Tammy. Look forward to it. Me too. And my listeners, gosh, I'm honored to be connecting with you. This show is really fun because I get to talk to amazing people, but it makes it even more fun to be dialoguing, interacting, and connecting with you. So be in touch if you've got some show ideas, if there's anything you want to share, thoughts, ideas, beliefs, whatever. If you want a free guided meditation, just email me at TammyBPhD at gmail.com. Go to my website, TammyBPhD.com, T-A-M-M-I. PhD.com. It's about relationship. I want to be in relationship with you. So God bless you. Take good care of yourself. Onward and upward. Bye for now.